Gertler grew up in a poor Jewish immigrant household in the East End. He was a student star. When he was still studying at the Slade School, his paintings of Jewish life brought him critical attention. In the 20s, he was acclaimed as one of the two or three best artists in the country. But Gertler suffered from tuberculosis and chronic depressions. He was frequently hospitalized, had money troubles, and towards the end of his life, his work went out of fashion. In the late spring of 1939, he committed suicide. A rare Gertler retrospective has just opened in London to mark the centenary of his birth. And we asked novelist Howard Jacobson to present his view of Mark Gertler's life and work. A few days after the painter Mark Gertler took his life here in his studio at the bottom of his Hampstead garden, a brief unfinished autobiographical fragment was found among his belongings. It had been begun five years earlier in 1934 and bore the title First Memories. I am standing on a wooden floor. There is land, England. England is moving towards me, not I to it. It's sort of gyrating towards me. I am standing, surrounded by my family, already with heavy packages straining from their necks, pressing their backs. Everybody is pushing and shoving. It doesn't feel friendly. All is chaos, selfish and straining. I am being pushed and hustled. Then later, outside Liverpool Street Station, we had arrived. London. All of us huddled together, looking rather like gypsies. Some passers-by through coins. There is no such thing as innocent memory. Childhood shapes experience, and in return experience recalls only what it wants of childhood. So there is nothing fanciful in saying that Mark Gertler went on feeling pushed and hustled in a gyrating England until his death 43 years later. In a manner of speaking, for he was always broke, always pressed, always dependent on the generosity of friends and patrons, passers-by went on throwing him coins. Nor did the gypsy tag ever completely leave him. An obituary referred to his gypsy gaudiness. Acquaintances noted a corsair quality in him, a vagabondage, a wandering Jewish spirit in torment. D.H. Lawrence praised the terrifying decomposition of his soul. Anthony Blunt, starting from a somewhat different idea of what it meant to be an Englishman, dispraised the vulgarity of his work. Whoever would understand the crowding of Gertler's canvases the turbulence of colour and sensation, the conflict between vitality and decorum, need only remember the shoving ship and huddled family. No good artist ever agrees with himself. When Gertler wasn't complaining of claustrophobia, of never having enjoyed an hour's comfort in his life. I'm continually fighting against being overcome by the sordidness of my surroundings and family. He was defending what was independent and authentic in his origins. I don't want to be abstract and cater for a few hyper-intellectual maniacs. I was born from a working man. I haven't had a grand education and I don't understand all this abstract intellectual nonsense. I am rather in search of reality. There was no shortage of reality in the spitalfields of his youth or in the home from which his mother looked out with fear and uncertainty at an alien world. She's a woman of some elegance in this fine early portrait painted when Gertler was barely in his twenties. 
but there is a habituated expectation of trouble in her eyes, a predisposition to anxiety in the agitation with which one hand arrests the movement of the other. A couple of years later, and those hands have become generalized, a peasant's hands. Reality has fallen back into the mythical, primitive, if not sordid. This is the house with no comfort in it, under which pressure the specific gives way to the symbolic. Costa family on Hampstead Heath, painted in the middle 20s, when Gertler's touch was surest, marvelously resolves what he knows of the actual with what he has learned of composition. Dressed in their tuppenny halfpenny street finery, the Costa family take indomitable possession of a stretch of landscape as surely English as anything in Constable. They are separate from one another, individually preoccupied, but together in their quiet assumption of their rights. Their déjeuner sur l'air is meagre, taken from common crockery, a parody of French good times, no less than English ones, as is the young man's attitude of indolent aestheticism. Renoir is invoked, and Manet, the French to whom the English were becoming increasingly enthralled, in order to commemorate the passing of the bourgeois idol into other hands. <laughs> Gertler's depiction of this transfer of ownership is not savage. He was no socialist. After his early successes while still a student at the Slade, the country houses of connoisseurs and the Salon of Bloomsbury were thrown open to him. Garsington, Lady Ottoline Morell's literary chateau, where novelists and poets danced diaphanously like his adorer, was Gertler's to come and go from. If there was anyone to know, Gertler knew him. Or her. The her, of course, was the problem it always is for a man whose imagination is tainted with poverty and inadequacy. Although he could paint all the good reasons for not taking up with Dora Carrington, the virginal complacency, the slithering stare, the free-floating spiritualism, the fruitlessness, literally, she has no fruit to offer. Gertler could no more let her go, could no more free himself from the bonds of chastity she tied him in, than Pip could dissociate his great expectations from Estella. Writing to his friend Kotiliansky, Gertler bemoans his obsession. I sometimes think my real life will not commence before my passion for Carrington ends, but God knows when it will end. This passion of mine may yet ruin me. It makes life so hateful to me, so ugly, so crooked. But there is so powerful a refusal of the idea of change here, so ecstatic a suspension of will, that the continuing masochism is a foregone conclusion. Dear friend, you cannot imagine how important you are to my work. I think of you in every stroke I do. Having told you this, you will not be surprised at my persistence in knowing you, in spite of your indifference and coldness towards me. There is only one thing. I feel that I am not worthy of your company, that I am far too vulgar and rough for you. Years later, Gertler was to write to Kotiliansky of his feeling that life had turned into one huge sanatorium. All generations of art critics, its variousness, its extravagance, its gaudiness, as they call it, are less puzzling if one connects them with that strain of humorous ardency and luxuriating self-affliction found among the poor, poetical, precocious English writers who have been central to English literature through being marginal to English society. Repetitive, unsatisfied longing is as instinctive to them as breathing, and Gertler finds a supreme metaphor for it in his most famous work, Merry-Go-Round. D. H. Lawrence's response to this terrible and dreadful picture is almost as famous as the picture itself. My dear Gertler, I won't say what I, as a man of words and ideas, read in this picture, but I do think that in this combination of blaze and violent mechanized rotation and complex involution and ghastly, utterly mindless human intensity of sensational extremity, you have made a real and ultimate revelation. The revelation, as it is usually understood, relates to war and man's involuntary exhilaration in its processes. <laughs>
timing of the painting's execution, 1916, the military uniforms on the figures, the snarling war horses, all point to a pacifist reading. But the sensational extremity, which Lawrence, as a man of words and ideas, does after all find in the picture, runs deeper than a commentary on the war effort. In this fearful and garish mechanical contrivance, where the horses plunge as well as revolve, where neither the colours nor the shapes offer any promise of cessation, has not Gertler painted all he knows of the open-mouthed compulsions of passion, ugly, crooked passion itself. But if Dora Carrington was the white hind Gertler pursued around and around in the certain knowledge that he would never bring her down, another Fata Morgana beckoned him in the guise of theory, more specifically, French theory. More specifically still, theory based on post-impressionism. He put up a bold fight. The artists of the day have thought so much about newness and revolution that they have forgotten art. Do you know what a Jew says to a Shatkin when the proposed bride is unsuitable? He says, very nice, very fine, but not for me. That's what I feel about the French pictures. But English art criticism, led by Roger Fry and Clive Bell, was going through one of its periodic fits of self-revulsion. All the familiar arguments about English parochialism were trotted out. We care too much about nature, overvalue verisimilitude, prefer practice to theory. The enemy that dogs him, Clive Bell said of Wyndham Lewis, is an excessive taste for life. And as always, when the English sense too much life in their productions, they know of no alternative but to turn to France. And not even Gertler, who had nothing to fear from the charge of insularity, could resist. Dearest Carrington, we lunched and went off to a certain Prince Bibesco, who has two Cezannes. Imagine my excitement when I heard of these at Garsington. When I arrived back here, a slow sort of depression set in, even a sort of boredom, an apathy. Uncertainty set in also. Sometimes I feel that perhaps one ought to paint more lightly, gaily. But if this is possible to some people, it is not to me. I can't work without desperate seriousness. Or, he might have added, without that intuition for reality which was both natively English and, paradoxically, natively his. Clearly, Gertler could not go on painting Rembrandt-like rabbis as he had done in his youth. But the ditching of his meticulously narrative gift in favour of the sculptural inconsequentialities which he painted after the post-impressionists hit town was a poor bargain. And the day would come when he would wander around the East End among the old Jews of his childhood and sigh over what was no longer open to him as a subject. Lucky old Rembrandt to have lived when it was right to paint such things. In the end it was Renoir, the least austere of the painters he was compelled to look at in Paris who made the most profound impression on him. Gertler could have done without the French. It's possible that Fry and Co. disturbed fatally an equilibrium which was always fragile. But for a while, he did make wonderful play with Renoir's luxuriance. The greedy eye and voluptuous palate of early Gertler here finds justification for superabundance in the idea of confined company. The beauty of the woman making drowsy the very air she breathes, infecting with the promise of her intimacy, the fruit, the flowers, the furniture, even the wine in the decanter. So that the foreshortening of the table comes to feel like an effect of our impatience to join her. To complain of a too muchness is like arguing with the odor of a rose. In the same way, it makes no sense to criticize the Queen of Sheba's coarse opulence. Her cheap jewellery is part of the story. Similarly, the spout of the coffee pot aimed at the empty cup. Sheba herself is all a topple, no better balanced in her grandeur than the bananas piled without elegance above the oranges and apples. Vulgarity? Of course, vulgarity is and always was Mark Gertler's subject. There is no good art without it. That Gertler should have been forced to doubt the very sources of his genius is a lasting discredit to English art criticism. But here the work is still obdurately alive, whereas no one now reads Clive Bell or Anthony Blunt. 
Howard Jacobson on Mark Gertler. And the exhibition continues at the Camden Arts Centre in London until March and then tours to Nottingham and Leeds.